will be today's moderator. Uh, first, a couple of reminders about the technical aspects of today's presentation. So today's talk will be recorded and it will be also live streamed via YouTube. This includes also the Q&A part of the talk. Um, if you have questions, please type your questions in the Q&A box um, with your name. And then at the end of the talk, I will call upon you so you can ask the question in person. If you have a very long question, it's just enough to type, you know, I have a question and I'll call you to ask uh, your question. You can also ask your question anonymously. And in this case, I will read the question uh, for you. And again, a reminder to our PhD students and postdocs, we would love to have you participating in the discussion and we will give priority to your questions. So with this, uh, it is my greatest pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Hal Caswell. Uh, Hal is mathem a mathematical biologist and demographer. Uh, he received his PhD in zoology from the Michigan State University, and he's currently a professor of mathematical demography and ecology at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. After a long stay as a senior scientist in biology at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Hal moved to the University of Amsterdam and where his research focus is on the demography of plants, animals, and humans. Um, his research in interests include also stochasticity, heterogeneity, evolutionary demography. He's author of numerous books, among which I wanna mention just a couple, the matrix population models, applied mathematical demography, and sensitivity analysis, matrix methods in demography and ecology. Hal has received numer numerous honors and rewards. I want to mention just uh, some of his most recent accomplishments. He has an advanced grant from the European Research Council uh, that focuses on the formal demography of kinship and families. In 2014, Howe received the Mendel Sheps Award for Mathematical Demography given by the Population Association of America. Uh, he's also honorary professor of biodemography at the University of Southern Denmark, Odense, and he's also distinguished research scholar at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in Rostock in Germany. His main current research focuses on the formal demography of kinship, developing a new analytical framework that um, expands the ability to explore the factors determining kinship networks. Cal, welcome, and over to you. Hey, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to come all the way to Philadelphia and for the nice introduction, um, I am going to share my screen and we'll see what happens. Yay, okay. So can you see a big red dot when I move around on the screen? Anyway, yes, home. yes, good, we do. good. Yep. So, uh, so um, I am going to try to talk today about uh, some new results, some of them very new, some of them like scribbled down on paper new, uh, about the formal demography of kinship. Formal demography, uh, one way to think about formal demography is that it is uh, distinguished by the fact that its results apply to any population of anyone, anywhere. In order to pull off that trick, formal demography always simplifies processes and structures and in doing so, it creates opportunities for new explorations. And you're going to see some of how that sequence of things works today. I've discovered that webinars, although 
it's a really nice idea and it really helps with our current pandemic situation can sometimes speed along too fast. So somewhere in the middle, I'm actually gonna pause and I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to think and maybe write down some questions because listening and writing down questions at the same time is confusing. Uh, and then we will continue. So let me start by saying something about kinship. Um, everybody knows that the universal aspects of demography are birth and death. Everybody's born, everybody dies. Family would be the next in line. Everybody's born, everybody dies, everybody has a family. And this motley looking crew of people that you see here is a bunch of my kin of various types. I'm somewhere in the back row. The theory that I'm going to develop and show you some results from uh, is mathematical, but the mathematics is simple. I know you don't believe me, but it's true. Um, it's based on the really basic demographic um, property of process of population projection. This is how population projection works. You have a vector that has an age structure, number of individuals in several age classes at one time, and it gets projected to the next time by multiplication by this matrix. The matrix has fertilities in the first row, and it has survival probabilities on the subdiagonal. And if there's uh, immigration in the population, then you add in a vector of immigrants in each age class. And you can write this simply in this way. U is the part of this matrix that does the survival, F is the part that does the fertility, and B is the vector for immigration. Easy, I hope, no problem. Uh, kinship is important. I think that maybe this is a venue where I don't have to argue this, um, this claim very much. Kinship is an important aspect of demography because it's fundamental to relations between generations, mobility, and um, experiences of death, orphanhood, all kinds of interesting things. I assume that everybody agrees with me that it's important. The, the modern approach to the demography of kinship started in 1974 with this paper by Leo Goodman and Nathan Kiefitz and Thomas Poem. What they did, their, their insight was to formulate this in terms of the properties of the kin of a particular individual and then calculate the number of her kin of different types at a given age by integrating over all the possible ways you could get kin of one type to go to kin of another type. The result, I'll show it, there's a little clip from the paper down here, was this complicated system of integral equations. Now, it's a fine system of integral equations. It's a little bit of a tour de force of integral equations, but it's really confusing to me. Anyway, so I set out to create a matrix formulation of this um, that would allow me to take a mortality schedule and a fertility schedule, and from that calculate the kin of all different types of a focal individual, I'll say more about her in a moment, uh, as a function of age. And I want not just the numbers of kin, I want the whole age distribution. And I want things that can be calculated from age distributions. And I'm not really satisfied with age distributions. I want to go beyond that. And I'm not satisfied with a single mortality schedule. I want time varying mortality schedules. And I'm not satisfied with just one of the two sexes. <clears throat> so there's lots of work to be done. Um, the result should also be easy to compute and not require a bunch of heavy duty simulations. So I've already started talking about focal individual, the idea that you develop your understanding of kin surrounding an individual. I've come to give this individual a name. This is focal. Focal is a female, you could do it with males, but usually a female of 
a specified age. Foco lives in a population with a specified mortality and fertility schedule and with a distribution, which I will denote by pi, distribution of the ages of mothers at the birth of their children. This is a standard thing that you can calculate from stable population theory, or you could actually measure it. So this is focal. And the question is, tell me about focal's kin. The insight is that the kin of focal are a population. This motley looking crew that we saw before, here's part of the population of my siblings is lurking back in here. It's a population of five individuals, including me. Here's the part of the population of my nephews. And um, here's the sole remaining member of the population of my uncles. Um, so any type of kin, the, the individuals are a population. If they're a population, then we might as well model them as one. So here's how we do that. And this is going to bring back the um, population projection idea. So I'm going to write k as an age structure vector of some kind of kin. I'm going to use letters to represent different kinds of kin. k is sort of reserved for generic kin, whatever it is. So the age structure vector of this type of kin at age x of focal, we're going to need a survival matrix, just like in the population projection calculation. And we're going to need an immigration, a subsidy uh, vector. The thing about the population of some kind of kin is that it is what is called, in some places, a subsidized population. The new individuals aren't created by the reproduction of the individuals that are already there. They come from somewhere else. So the new daughters of Focal are not created by the reproduction of the current daughters of Focal. That would be granddaughters. The new daughters of Focal come from the reproduction of Focal. Um, and we need an initial condition. This is a dynamical system. We have to tell it where to start. So we need the vector, a structure vector of this type of kin that Focal has at her birth. So we can build a model. This is a, this is a kinship network. This was Nathan Kiefitz's idea to, to describe it this way, and it's really, really useful. Here's Focal in the middle. Here's daughters, granddaughters, great-granddaughters. Here's mother grandmother, great-grandmother. Coming off the side here, here's older sisters and younger sisters, nieces through older, uh, older sisters, nieces through younger sisters, aunts and cousins. And you could extend this as far as you want in any of the directions. I'm going to look particularly for the next couple of minutes at this. This is the core. This is Focal, her mother, her daughters, her older sisters, and her younger sisters. So let's look at this, use our logic of population projection to see what we can do with these four populations of kin. Ready? The dynamics of Focal's daughters, I'm going to use a, a vector which I'll denote by A, at age X. So what's the initial condition? How many daughters did Focal have when she was born? None. Subsidy. How many new daughters does Focal get at age X? New daughters arriving, uh, you know, um, uh, new daughters of Focal come from applying the fertility matrix to the age distribution of Focal, which is just that she is at age X. So here's the dynamic expression for the daughters of Focal map from one age to the next. How about mothers? Focal only has one. At, for the initial condition, when Focal is born, we know that she had one mother. 
And we don't know the age, but we know the distribution of that age. And so the initial condition, the initial vector of the population of Focal's mother is simply that age distribution of mothers at the birth of their children. Subsidy, Focal doesn't get any new mothers. So this model does not include stepmothers or uh, other kinds of modifications. So it's only biological mother of Focal. So the subsidy term is zero. And here's the dynamic expression for the, um, for the, for the mothers of Focal. The younger sisters of Focal, initial condition, when Focal is born, by definition, she has no younger sisters, so the initial condition is zero. Subsidy, Focal can get new younger sisters. Those come from applying the fertility matrix to the vector of Focal's mother, because Focal's new younger sisters are the children of her mother. And so here's the dynamic expression for younger sisters of Focal. Older sisters of Focal. When Focal is born, she can have older sisters. Those older sisters are the children of Focal's mother at the point where Focal is born. We don't know the age of Focal's mother when Focal is born, but we know the distribution of that age. And so we can take that distribution and use it to weight the distribution of children. That gives us the initial number of older sisters of Focal when she's born. Subsidy, Focal can't get any new older sisters after she's born. So no blended families in which uh, new older sisters might arrive. Uh, biologically speaking, Focal can't get any new older sisters after she's born. So we can walk through this entire network and extensions of it doing exactly this same logic. When we do that, we get this, we get this um, table, which you're not supposed to look at. We're gonna, to, what you need to notice is here's all these letters, all these different kinds of kin. Here's an expression for the, here's an expression for the, the initial condition. Here's an expression for the subsidy term. And this defines the entire, um, defines the entire kinship network. Oops, one second here. There we go. Wow, okay. Let's do an example. Uh, I pulled this out of the human mortality and human fertility databases. Japan between 1947 and 2014 went through some big demographic changes. In 1947, life expectancy was 54 years. That went up by 60 odd percent to 87 years. Total fertility rate was 4.6. It dropped to 1.4. Net reproductive rate was 1.7. It went down to 0 0.7. Uh, so um, typical, typical demographic development. Let's look at some kin. So this graph on the x-axis is the age of focal. And on the y-axis is the number, expected number of her daughters. The red curve is under 1947 conditions. The blue curve is under 2014 conditions. Under 1947 conditions, focal begins reproducing at about age 20 reproduces, accumulates some number of daughters, which then begin to fall off as Focal stops reproducing, and now her daughters are dying off. Under 2014 conditions, Focal starts reproducing at about 20, reproduces more slowly. By the time Focal is in her 40s, she has stopped reproducing, but her daughters survive for a very long time and not don't begin to die off until Focal is very, very old. This is Focal's granddaughters, and it's the same, it's the same pattern, but shifted. And 
slightly lower values. Uh, this is mothers and grandmothers, but I'm going to skip over that. Um, given the fact that we now have the complete age distribution vectors for these kin, we can calculate other things. We can look at things like the prevalence of diseases or disability or health. We can look at measures of economic dependency, coefficients of relatedness. We can look at net reproductive value. So I did just one example. This is the prevalence of dementia among Japanese women as a function of age in 2015. And it looks just like you would expect. It goes up as they become very old. I don't have any prevalence data for dementia in 1947, so I just used this one. Here's, as a function of the age of focal, this is mothers with dementia under 1947 conditions. The red line under 2014 conditions, the blue line. This is for grandmothers, same thing. So when focal is 50 years old, she's many times more likely to have a mother with dementia under 2014 conditions than she is under 1947 conditions because her mother lives long enough to develop dementia. Here's another, here's another interesting thing. I got interested in the, in the reports that the um, uh, experience of the death of a close relative can be a traumatic health influencing event. And so we can extend this model. We can now create a vector that includes the age structure vector for the living kin and the age structure vector for the dead kin stacked on top of each other. I'm gonna put a little squiggly tilde over the top of symbols to indicate that they're block structured, that they're blocks like living and dead in there. And the model becomes almost exactly the same, except now we have a matrix that includes survival of the living kin, mortality of the kin that die, and just the difference between this zero and this identity matrix gives you the difference between calculating the deaths of kin that focal experiences at age x and the cumulative deaths of kin that Focal has experienced up to age X. So this is what happens when you look at the deaths of daughters in Japan. The blue line here is under 2014 conditions. It's extraordinarily rare for Focal to experience the death of a daughter before Focal is about 80 years old. Whereas under 1947 conditions, many times more likely to experience the death of a daughter earlier in life and much more so. This is the cumulative number of deaths up to a given age. So obviously it doesn't start until Focal begins to have daughters, but under 1947 conditions, it goes up much more rapidly than under 2014 conditions. The experience of the death of a child was far more common under 1947 conditions, just implied by the mortality and fertility schedules, than was the case under 2014 conditions. Uh, this is sisters, it's the same story. Whew. Okay. I mentioned that I wasn't gonna be satisfied with ages because there are other kinds of things that matter. There are things which you can also classify individuals by, which I will refer to as stages. So to analyze kin in this framework, we need again to build a block structured vector, which now has the age structures and the stage structures for all of the kin. And there's machinery for um, how, to, how to do this, which has been developed over the years. It's not difficult, we'll see. Okay, so it looks difficult, but it's not. You're building 
Again, with the tildes to indicate this block structure, you build a survival matrix that accounts for age classes and stages, and that accounts for the fertility of age classes and stages. It all ends up being a matrix and a subsidy vector. The table that describes all of the different types of kin looks exactly the same, except now everything has tildes over it. What do I mean by a stage? How about parity? Parity is a thing that obviously affects fertility. And so we can build using age parity specific fertility data from the human fertility database. We can build the, um, the matrices. Uh, I chose Slovakia. It does it, it has another one of these patterns of demographic transition. 1960, it had a total fertility rate of 3.6, which dropped by 2014 to 1.5, and a life expectancy of 62 that went up to 80. So we generate the matrices, do exactly the same calculations, and this is the daughters of Focal, same graph that we've seen a couple of times previously, uh, like, there, for instance, this one on the left here is the daughters of Focal. So now you can see a similar pattern here, 1960 conditions, 2014 conditions, fewer daughters, they spread out longer. But now what you see is they're color coded inside into parity. So Focal's daughters are born in parity zero, match. Then as focal ages, she begins to have daughters that are in parity one, and then two, three, four. By the time focal is elderly, she can expect to have this chunk of daughters uh, in parity five plus. Under 2014 conditions, you almost never see any parity five plus daughters, hardly ever see any parity four daughters, very few three, and it's the, the distribution is full of these low parity individuals. Uh, that's for aunts, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, if you normalize it so that it, those colors add up to one, you get the proportional parity structure. So that's here. This is um, in 1960 and in 2014. In 1960, the, by the time Focal gets to be say 60 years old, um, her, big chunk of her daughters are in parity three, four, and five. Under 2014 conditions, it's this much smaller chunk of the distribution. So the kinship model here is tracking not just the effects of mortality and fertility, but also the uh, parity transition structure and giving information on the relative numbers of individuals in different parity. And you can also we talk about this in the paper about this. You can also uh, get SIBship sizes from parity information. The parity of Focal's daughters is the SIBship size of the granddaughters. So let's see how we're doing here. Ha. Okay. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to breathe. Just Relax. You can write down questions. You can wonder what on earth just happened. Um, and then in a couple of minutes, I will return. Don't go anywhere.
Okay, welcome back. I hope there's still some people here. It's like you're talking into a vacuum when you talk on these, on these webinars. Uh, okay, I'm gonna trust there's still people out there on the other end of the line. Uh, all of the calculations that I've shown so far have had time invariant demographic rates. That is, there's a mortality schedule, there's a fertility schedule. Those remain constant and focal, lives out her life under that fixed mortality and fertility schedule. And that's why I was trying to be careful to say that under 2014 conditions or under 1947 conditions, rather than saying in 1947. But it's obviously gonna be fun to get time varying demographic rates. So I have worked this out, I'm working on this with your colleague there, Pen Ji Sung, can't be here today because for some reason she was involved with another kind of demographic project. Um, in any rate, we're now going to have a series of survival matrices and a series of fertility matrices. And this is going to allow, and Vogel is going to live out her life subject to a sequence of these that comes along one after the other after the other. This lets us do two interesting things that I have never seen done with kinship. One is the history of the past. Go to the, demo, the human uh, mortality and fertility databases and we get past records of demographic rates. But we can now also analyze the future because pretty much every country does population projections which create series of mortality and fertility schedules over some period of time into the future based on some assumptions about how mortality and fertility will develop. Lots of effort is expended into developing sophisticated ways to do this, but what you end up with is a set of matrices that describe the future. And in order to describe time varying kin, we need to enlarge our thinking now we have an age structure vector of kin at age x of focal at time t. And the dynamics of that at age x plus one and t plus one, those kin come from the kin at age x at time t operated on by this survival matrix plus the subsidy vector that comes at age x and time t. You remember that we had to have initial conditions to tell the process where to start. Now we need what are called boundary conditions to tell the process where to start. So it's a little carefully prepared diagram down here. We have time and we have age and we need to specify at time zero, we need to specify the kin age structure vectors 
um, for all the ages, that is going up here, at time zero. And we need to do the same thing for age zero at all the times. Specify those two boundaries of this square. Once we do that, once we do that, these equations, this equation right here, oops, fills in all of this box. Once we've filled in the box, we can now do the familiar thing of looking at cohorts. The focal is born here and ages along this diagonal, we're looking at the kinship vectors, the kin vectors of fo that focal has every point in her life, given that she started at this point. Or we can say, if we look at a particular time and look at all the different ages of focal, then we get a period calculation. And if we wanted to, we could ask for a particular age of focal, how does her kin age structure vector change as we go over time? So here's the past and the future of Sweden. This is 1891 out to 2120. The vertical line distinguishes the past and the future, the year 2018. So up from 1891 to 2018, this is life expectancy coming from the human mortality database. This is total fertility rate coming from the human fertility database. It wiggles around and it goes up and this down. I just bumped it up against the life expectancy projection and the total fertility rate projection created by the Swedish Statistical Office in their most recent um, projection of the future population of Sweden, which started in 2018. You can see that they're optimistically assuming that the future will be much calmer in Sweden than the past was. Um, in particular, you'd notice that something happened back here in, in 1918 that shows up in all the um, life expectancy graphs you see. They had no way to predict what was going to happen in 2020. It'd be interesting to see if that changes. But anyway, we've got the past, we've got the future. Let's see what we can do with it. This is daughters of focal. This is the period calculations. That is, in 1891, uh, focal uh, had a pattern of number of daughters given by this blue line. 1921, it was this red kind of wiggly line. 1951, this yellow line, it's like this peak is being moved uh, to older ages of focal when you look at later periods. Then you get to much later periods, 2010, 2050, 2080, 2120, and the, um, and the number of daughters has dropped and it's now it's very smooth because basically mortality is really low. Here's the cohort pattern. These are the 1891 cohort of focal started reproducing about 20 years later, produced a lot of daughters, and then they began to die off. Later cohorts begin reproducing about the same age, increase, and then those daughters live for a very long time. And this is the age pattern. If you look at focal at age 15, then the number of daughters over the years is zero. You know, reproduction at that age in the fertility database. And if you look at um, later ages, you get these patterns. I haven't discerned any particular useful patterns in there, but I'm interested in it. These are aunts. I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to finish by saying just a few words about <clears throat> two sex models. So Goodman and Kiefitz and Pullum uh, 
quite explicitly uh, set up their model to calculate female kin produced through female lineages. Focal, the daughters of Focal, the granddaughters of Focal through Focal's daughters, and so on. And what I want to show you is the first steps toward expanding that to consider male and female kin through male and female lineages. And the goal is to be able to incorporate differences between males and females in mortality, we all know about that, and also fertility. So under some conditions, age-specific fertility rates for men look like this and women like this. Men have a greatly extended uh, range of reproductive years. This is Senegal in 2013, a high uh, fertility population. This is France in 2012, and the distributions of age-specific fertility rates are much more similar to each other. Uh, it does not seem to be easy to get this kind of data, but hey, if we have that, then we can create male, female and male survival matrices, female and male fertility matrices, distributions of female and male ages of birth. We'll need a sex ratio in there somewhere. And once again, we create block structured vectors and that include female and male age structures, block structured survival matrices that include male and um, and a block structured uh, subsidy vector. The descendants have a different structure. Here's focal daughters, granddaughters, great granddaughters. This is the classic version. Now we have focal producing daughters and sons, these are children. Daughters produce granddaughters and grandsons. Sons produce granddaughters and grandsons. Granddaughters produce great granddaughters and great grandsons. So you have this uh, nice pattern of the sexes producing each other uh, in exactly the same way that happened here. And so the form of the model is exactly the same. Skip over that one. Um, there's also questions about demographic stochasticity. These are small populations. I have five siblings. That's a small number to model as a population. And so um, the chance events of mortality and fertility generate variability, uh, I pretty well know how to do this, but it's not really ready to show you. So let me stop. Um, I wanna stop and if I was gonna give a take home message for this, it would be that we have, a, we have a very powerful formal theory for kinship at this point. The kin of focal are population, and we can use that to develop models, time invariant models, time varying models, multi state models, two sex models, stochastic models. Um, the reason I wanted to keep showing that same matrix equation is that it's easy to compute, and the form of the equation stays the same. So the formal aspect of this uh, demographic analysis has succeeded in creating something that keeps the same form, even if you're looking at different kinds of situations. It's really interesting to me how over relatively short periods of time, these examples, Japan, Slovakia, Sweden, can show interesting changes in age structures, parity structures, the experience of the death of kin, the prevalences of diseases um, that, are, that um, are implied by the changes in mortality and fertility schedules. There's a lot of extensions that still need to be done. How would you put spatial relationships in here? How would you put in stepkin, kin by marriage? That one is really, really hard. You 
immigration, joint distributions of ages of mothers and fathers, explicit pair formation. I don't even know how to think about that one. Uh, comparative studies. These examples that I've used are just like little examples, but what about serious comparative studies of anthropological or historical or economic differences? And finally, there are interesting biodemography questions about kinship and more. There's always more. So thank you very much. Um, I am going to be looking for um, one or more postdocs at some point when it becomes clear how hiring postdocs can actually work in this pandemic era, which at the moment is not totally clear here in the Netherlands. So uh, if you're interested, contact me. Um, and if uh, at some point that will happen. And with that, Think. Yes, with that, I will stop and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hal, for this very, very interesting talk. So we don't get to hear as many talks and about formal demography at the colloquium. It was really very interesting. And we have several questions. And I would like to invite first Joel Cohen. Um, to ask his question. Joe. Okay, thank you, Hal, for this beautiful talk. Uh, really terrific. And I also enjoyed hearing you talk uh, about variance in life expectancy at an earlier date. So I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to learn from you. Does your model assume independence between the probability distribution of ages of mothers at the birth of a child, such as focal, and the fertility of offspring, such as focal, well, how are the results affected if mothers who defer childbearing to older ages have daughters who do the same? More generally, what if the several, I think, implicit assumptions of independence in this model don't hold? Um. So the, the model has, uh, has no effect of, so the, the mother's age at the birth of focal does not have any effect on focal's subsequent survival or fertility. Um, those kinds of maternal age effects uh, can be built in. I, so the, there was this paper on uh, Rotifer uh, maternal age effects uh, that we had in PNAS that you were involved in editing. And you could take that model and put that in as the component. What you would have then would be uh, Focal's kin characterized by their ages and the age of their mother at the time they were born. And then you'd have block structured matrices that would project those vectors, it would get complicated, but it could be done. Um, there's, a, there's another independence assumption lurking in there, which is what I thought you were going to ask about, which is in the two sex version of the model, you need the distribution of mothers at the age of their children, the age of giving birth, and you need the distribution of fathers age at reproduction. And at the moment, I only know how to do that, treating those as independent. They're obviously not. So th this sounds like a good area for your future postdoc to uh, give some thought to. Thanks. Beautiful talk. Beautiful work, Hal. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Jerry, you have three or four questions for Hal. So please, it's your turn. Uh, I'm an economist, not a formal demographer. Um, the questions I put in the box are basically the kind of questions for clarification that would have been useful along the way, but are not very useful, I think, at the end of the talk. Um, you might want to look at them to see things I didn't find clear. Okay. But the um, question I do have of a more general sort is 
how to think about the, such a model if one thinks there are behavioral choices made for demographic outcomes, for fertility, for migration, for marriage, whatever. Um, is there, I, I don't know quite how to think about behavioral choices within this kind of a framework. Well, and I think in some sense, that's the fundamental question of any aspect of demography or any other science. Um, what do you need to know about an individual to satisfy you that you know what's going to happen to it? So demography says, all I need to know is its age. If I know the age of the individual. I know what its fertility is going to be. I know what its survival probability is going to be. And then these get tabulated into mortality and fertility uh, schedules. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes along and says, well, but wait a minute, it's not just the age of the individual. It might have to do with their partnership status. It might have to do with uh, also with their uh, economic status. It, and then, so then you start having to build these in each one of those steps um, provides the background against which you can ask the next question. So, um, you know, the, the idea that uh, a whole bunch of demography is based on the fact that age determines everything that you need to know. And you're talking about what happens if you want to build in something else as complicated as human decision-making? That's a real challenge. But, but do you see the per sort of person who likes real challenges? <laughs> Sorry, say again? I was saying you seem to be the sort of person who likes real challenges. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, there, there are some that I'm less confident about being able to meet than others. I see. Well, I, I might sign up to be your postdoc. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle, your turn. Hi, Hal. Uh, thanks for a very uh, stimulating and interesting talk. My first Thank question you. was was related to, to uh, Joel's question, but more uh, in the area of mortality, whether you have thought of potentially introducing correlation among family members uh, in, in health, where you have, you know, long, in your, in your profiles, you have long living uh, mothers, uh, but their daughters, uh, their survival is also correlated. So whether you're thinking of potentially uh, introducing at some point uh, correlation uh, among family members in terms of health. But I, I guess my, my other two other points were um, the first one on your time, when you introduce your time varying framework, you introduce initial, the, you, you start worrying about initial conditions. And I guess at that point, I was wondering whether they actually really matter or whether you actually have some kind of weak ergodicity here uh, that would tell you that maybe you don't need to worry about um, initial conditions. And then finally, I was wondering whether you're thinking of calibrating your age profiles, for example, you know, number of surviving daughters with actual data, such as census data from uh, different historical periods that could potentially uh, help you calibrate your, your equations and your results? Uh, let's see, those are, so those are really interesting questions. Um, the, so the first one is, um, there isn't really any way to do that that I know of. Um, so I'm gonna skip over that one because the other two, um, so the second one, um, you wondered about, you were wondering about ergodicity, wondering about whether initial conditions matter. And they do. And the reason that they do um, is that the process doesn't run long enough for ergodicity to kick in. That is, this is not, you can't let X go to infinity the way you can let time go to infinity in a lot of situations and allow for ergodic results to appear because focal doesn't live forever. 
So the um, uh, there is the there is the potential for um, the initial conditions to have an, an influence. It hasn't really I haven't looked at it in any detail yet. Um, so I think that falls under the category of really interesting theoretical questions about this. Um, for the, the point of the model is not to calibrate it. Uh, one of the, when I read, I went back and reread uh, Goodman, Kiefitz and Pullum's paper. One of the things that interested me about it was that over and over again, they said, we don't expect this to agree with the results of a census. That there's no reason to expect it to agree with the results of a census because they're calculating the implications of a mortality and fertility schedule in their case under a set of simplifying assumptions. The census is gonna show the kinship structure that's actually there. So it's gonna show the result, not only of the mortality and fertility schedules, but of all the other things that aren't in the model. So what you want is to actually look at the errors, not treat it as a calibration problem. Even, in, um, even when you look at time varying mortality and fertility though, at that points, you get closer to reality um, and, and, and perhaps informing um, the second part of your talk, I guess. Yeah. But that's to me, to me, that's, I mentioned uh, comparative studies. That's part of what I, I include under that rubric is comparing the results of the model with the results of censuses or of other kinds of, uh, of data on a large enough scale that you can say something about patterns of when there appear to be important deviations from the kinship structure that is implied by mortality and fertility uh, varying in certain ways versus what's actually there. Okay, thank you. We have a question. To figure that out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Sam, you have a question. So it's your turn. Unmute. Um, well, my question really was very similar to that of Mitchell, not surprisingly, um, my, my frequent co-author. It was about heterogeneity and mortality. But, but I would, uh, Hal, number one, this was a fascinating talk and, and beautifully presented. And uh, I, I wonder whether heterogeneity, either in fertility or mortality, is going to create in any category more surviving kin uh, uh, of, for any particular person than would be indicated by assuming there's no heterogeneity and that everyone has the same mean value of fertility and mortality. For example, the number of, of siblings in a sibship depends not only on the mean fertility of women, but on the variance in uh, fertility in women. And in some cases, there are more than twice as many people in your sibship as indicated as is indicated by the number of uh, children born per woman. So I, I think heterogeneity uh, is worth some exploration within your system. I agree in exactly the right place. And uh, th that would be an extension that I think might be worthwhile. I, I agree. The um, uh, putting in things like parity um, is essentially um, looking at one aspect of heterogeneity. If, if compared to a model that just has age, a model that has both age and parity has incorporated uh, an important dimension of heterogeneity. Um, there's other kinds uh, that would be really interesting to put in there. Um, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the parity distribution will be different in a population, inevitably different and more variable in a population that has uh, heterogeneity in it than in a population with no heterogeneity in, in the sure. okay. mortality uh, of fertility. I agree. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, so it's one o'clock and with this, this is the end of the talk. How thank you so much for giving this really exciting, very interesting talk. Um, and thank you for participating in the colloquium and everyone else will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to everybody that uh, was apparently lurking out there in the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.